Father, this morning we come to you, Lord, once again, trusting and believing you will speak to us. For you always speak. The whole of creation of God declares about you. Everything. So we do not actually have to ask you to speak to us. We ask, O oh Lord, touch our ears. That we may hear your voice. Recognize your voice. Respond to that voice. That we'll hear more and more from you. For these are troubled days, dark days, difficult days. But for your children, you will be always there. Your voice, O God, you promised us, will lead us and show us the way to take. So speak to us this morning once again. I pray, Lord, your word will bring comfort, restoration, correction, healing, deliverance to your people. Here now and to the rest of the world as it goes forth. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, we've been looking at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I think we'll just look at that today. It all begins, let's go back to the first, we're looking at only the first three verses, so if I can have that, that three verses together, it would be great. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Like I said, it's an experience. It is not a statement. It's an experience. And God is bringing us little by little into that experience where we know him as our, our shepherd, as my shepherd. We all begin by praying, Our Father who art in heaven. That's how Jesus taught. But that's not how Jesus prayed. He taught us, his disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. But when he spoke, he said, My Father, My Father, My Father. He didn't say Our Father. But he taught us to say Our Father because he knew we didn't experience him yet. As my father. Yet when he rose from the dead to Mary Magdalene, this is what he said. Go and tell the disciples that I have risen. That I am going to my father and now you will know. Now you will know him as my father. So this is an experience. The Lord is my shepherd. Once we know him as my shepherd, then we can confidently say out of experience, I shall not want. I will not lack. I shall not want. It's an experience. But it's only after this experience we progressively start experiencing these things. We all have experienced this at different levels, but we need to keep growing in this. And it all begins by, he says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the, in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you look at it in the order, you will see it twice it is mentioned. He leads me. He leads me. He leads me. He leads me beside the still waters. Then suddenly the meaning changes. He leads me beside the still waters. For what? So that for those are the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. For what? To restore my soul. That's how it works. First he has to bring restoration. He restores. He says, lie down in the green pastures and feed off it. And be restored. And as you are restored, I will lead you. And you may say, it's not still waters that I face. It's turbulent waters. Muddy waters. Uncertain waters. 
He says, that's why I tell you first, lie down. First, he makes me lie down. That's the most difficult part. He makes me lie down. Now, if you take it in a human comparison, it's very easy. We know how to make a child lie down. Right? So we have a few images. Turn it up, put it upside down, put your hand down and keep it down. Sleep. God doesn't do stuff like that, right? What does he do to make us lie down? He starts changing the circumstances of our life so that we are forced to lie down. We'll come to that. First, he makes me lie down. Sometimes we lie down. Sometimes he has to make us lie down. God giving us rest is one thing. We finding rest is another thing. Are we getting the picture? There is a promise. There is this promise. I will lead you to still waters. I will restore your soul. And all the promises of Psalm 23 are promises. But the promise is conditional always to hearing his voice. Hearing his voice. We have to hear. We have to obey. We have to be willing. If I'm right, Isaiah 119, right? Isaiah 119 says, If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you're willing and obedient, that's the key. It doesn't say if you follow. How easy it would be to say that if you follow, you will eat the good of the land. Because everybody follows. That's why everybody is sitting in the house of God today. You have followed here. But God says, no, that's not how you, how you eat. If you, how you experience the life of Christ, the good of the land in the Old Testament for us is the life of Christ. If you're willing and obedient. Do you know that we can follow without ever obeying? We can follow without actually being willing. Imagine a road. That is enclosed on both sides. And there is a crowd behind you. You have no way to turn. You have to keep moving. If you don't keep moving, you will be trampled upon. Because the crowd keeps pushing you from back. There is pressure from all sides. So what do you do? You keep moving. Are you willing? Are you obedient? No, you are not. You are neither willing nor obedient. You are just moving along because of the pressure of the circumstances. That's how Israel moved. Israel moved because of the pressure of the circumstances. They were neither willing nor were they obedient. They were willing to get out of Egypt. But once they got out of Egypt, they were no longer so willing. Because they only heard Come out and there's a land flowing with milk and honey. They came out and they found there was neither milk nor honey. They said, okay, if you can't have milk and honey, let's go back because there is meat there. And God said, you can't go back. Why? Because I shut the door. Now keep moving. So they kept moving. How many years did they move? 40 years. Were they willing? No. Were they obedient? No. But they moved. That's the truth about the church too. We are just, many are just moving because we have to move. What do I do? I go to church on Sundays. Why? That's what I always did. I don't know anything else to do. So I go. We are neither willing, nor are we obedient. We are just by circumstance. I wish, when I look at the children, I sometimes wonder how many of these children would be in church if they were not made to come by their parents. How many of them would really come? But that's good, because they shouldn't have a choice when they are small. 
But once they grow older, they should choose to come. Let someone come and preach another gospel. That there is no hell, no punishment for sin. You can be whatever you want. How many will keep moving? Let's change the gospel for five minutes. You know what? Nothing matters whether you read your word or not, whether you pray or not, whether you worship or not. There is no hell, there is no punishment for sin. You can do whatever you want. And if that were true, how many would come back next Sunday? If you come back next Sunday, if you believe that and come back next Sunday, if you really believe that and come back next Sunday, the only reason you came back is because you love Jesus. And no other reason. That's why when Israel left Egypt, only one man loved Christ. The rest moved. The promises of God, the commandments of God, are the green pastures. Are the green pastures. He makes me rest in them. He makes me rest in the promises of God. There is one thing reading the promises of God. There is one thing memorizing the words of God. There is another thing meditating upon the words of God. There is another thing which is called resting in the promises of God. Rest means, what does it mean? Means, I can rest on this. But what if when I came in the morning and so one leg was cracked, I'll sit like this. Why? I don't want to put weight on it because I'm not really resting, I'm tense. Why? Because I'm not sure whether it'll take my weight or I will fall down in front of all the people. Some people sit, but they are not resting. Even when they are lying down in their bed, they are not resting, but they are troubled inside. Rest means, literally rest spiritually means, I am allowing God to take the weight of my body, my soul, my spirit, my entire life. He takes the weight, not me. I rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to the promises of God in Christ and says they have the power to carry the weight of your situation. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? He makes me lie down. That's why he has to make me lie down. We'll come to that. The entire portion Portions of Hebrews 3 and 4 talks about this. That's why Hebrew, um, Psalm 23 is not a corporate experience. It's a personal experience. I want to look at Hebrews 3 first. Let's read scripture today, verse 7 onwards. These are people who were led out. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. What does it mean? They will never lie down. They will never lie down. That's what he said. Did he provide for them? Forty years he provided for them. He took care of them. They were not ill. They were clothed. They were fed. They were sheltered. They were protected. They had everything. Forty years. But they did not know what was to lie down. They did not enter into his rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You know what this does? I want you to, I want you to look at that. He says, this is the problem. Unbelief will make you and me depart from the living God. If the living God, I have departed from the living God and I still experience something, then what am I experiencing? I'm experiencing a God who is not living.
Okay, uh, let me explain to you. Post service, you go home. You go home, you go home to your mother, and your mother says, okay, sit down, and she heats or cooks and gives you lunch. Did you experience food? Yes? Did you experience your mother too? Yes. You go to a vending machine, put in something and punch, and food comes out and you eat. Do you experience food? Did you experience your mother? No. Israel did not experience God in the wilderness. They experienced food and provision. He was just a vending machine for them. But Moses experienced God. Joshua experienced God. Caleb experienced God. He was not a vending machine. They experienced him. That's what he is saying. You can depart from the living God. The living God. And still experience your provision in your everyday life. You have experienced this provision. Why? It's got nothing to do with my faithfulness. It's got to do with his faithfulness. Because scripture says, even when we are unfaithful, he is still faithful. Why? Because he brought us out of Egypt. He chose us. If you look at that 40 year journey and them coming out of Egypt, there is only one thing and one thing all of Israel did. Totally obedient, one thing alone they did. You know what they did? They killed the Passover lamb, put on the lentils and ate the Passover lamb. That's the only thing they did. Nothing else it is written, all of them did with the whole heart. Only one thing. Why? Nobody died. So when God said, if you don't do it and you step out, the angel of death will kill you, they were all afraid and they all did it and ate it. And they stayed inside. That's the only thing they did. After that, they came out, they didn't obey. They were neither willing, nor were they obedient. Yet God took care of them. Why? God took care of them because they had believed in the crucified Jesus. They believed for salvation from sins alone. And there are many Christians like they have believed for salvation and salvation alone. And he still takes care of them because he is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. After that, the rest of their life, if you look, it's a history of wandering. Wandering, wandering. There is a testimony, you know, I experienced this, I experienced this, I experienced that. God is saying, no. Did you experience the living God? I am living. Everything about me, read in the word, is called living. The living God, the living water, the living stone, everything is living. Do you experience me as the living God? Continue. Verse 15. But exhort one another daily while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitful of sin, unbelief and disobedience, a hardening of the heart takes. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. That is, when they looked at the Passover lamb and the blood, they believed. And God says, we became partakers of Christ. And if we hold the beginning and continue all the way till the end, we will partake more and more and more and more of Christ. More and more of Christ. Verse 15. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled, indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, but to those who did not obey? It wasn't the same crowd who was taken care of. With whom was he angry 40 years? How many people were there with whom he was not angry? Only three. How many did he bring out? 600,000 families. Only three he was not angry. Did anybody else enter into his rest? No. They did not. Why? Because they did not obey. They wouldn't lie down. How could he make them lie down? He was trying his best to make them lie down. Now we too are being led out. We too are being led out. But do we understand his ways and his purpose? Everyone sitting here, let me tell you, has problems in life, at home, at your workplace, maybe serious problems. But the question is, can we just lie down? Can God give us rest? 
Why is it so important? Because unless we lie down in that green, feed on the word of God, promises the word of God, and allow the word of God to take the weight of our problems, he cannot do what he does next in Psalm 23. What does he does? He restores our soul. He is a God who wants to bring restoration. He restores. He's a God of restoration. He wants to lead us to still waters so that he can bring restoration. He wants to restore my soul. But how can he restore my soul if soul if he can't lead me? Can he lead me? Hebrews 4, 1 to 3. Hebrews is the 3 and 4 revolves around us. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, the promise still remains. Even today, the promise remains. See, if you did not have rest till yesterday, you know what? Today, you can still enter into his rest. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Don't come short of his rest. All our testimonies, if our testimonies are only the testimonies like the children of Israel in the wilderness, it's no testimony for God. It is testimony for the world. Wow, your clothes never wore off. Wow, your sandals never wore off. Wow, for 40 years you ate. 40 years you were not ill. But did you know God? Did you obey Him? Did you have rest? Why? For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. The word of God which you hear even today has to profit you. How does it profit you? It, it's profited only when it is mixed with faith in those who hear it. It has to be mixed with faith. I hear the word, I have to believe. Why do I have to believe? Because God said so. He said so. We who have believed, verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. They were neither willing nor were they obedient. Verse 9 to 11. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. God is still saying there still remains a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. How do you know you have ceased from your works? You stop. First sign is what? You stop worrying. It doesn't mean your problems have gone away. It means you have stopped worrying. Two, you stop fearing. Naresh, you stop fearing. Fearing is basically a fear of losing something. Once you have found the shepherd, you don't fear. Why? What can you lose? It's only when you search for something beyond the shepherd, you fear. And you don't trust the shepherd. Verse 11. Yeah, let's go. For he who entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest. Let anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Right? Now we have looked at this in context. Now that is why verse 12 comes. The problem is we all know Hebrews 4.12. We don't know verses 1 to 11. Everybody knows 4.12. What does 4.12 says? For the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You can pretend God says before everybody, not before my word. It will cut you through. It will expose you. It will show you. You haven't put found your rest in me. You haven't found your rest in me. Why? Let us be diligent to enter that rest. Another version will say, let us labor. Work hard. Now you find it contradictory, right? Because you work hard and you rest. God says, you know what? No, no, no. You have to work hard to rest. To enter into my rest is a work. It's a hard work. Why? You have to sit down. 
you got a thousand problems and hundred people calling for your attention, prayer, ministry, whatever it is, but God says, sit down. That's not your problem. That's my problem. Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, let me. God says, sit down. You know how difficult it is for workaholics to sit down? How difficult it is for anxious people to sit down? How difficult it is for angry people not to respond? How difficult. That's why God says you have to labor to enter into that rest. It's not an easy thing. To sit down is a very difficult thing. To rest is a very difficult thing. So what do psychologists and psychiatrists say? If you cannot sleep, lie there and count the sheep. One, two, then you will fall asleep. Some people go up to 500, 600, they are still awake. It doesn't work. Work for day, two days, but you know what God says? Don't count the sheep, count on the shepherd. You can sleep. The world has got it wrong. He says, don't count the sheep, count on the shepherd. When he comes in, you will sleep. That's what Psalm 131 says. It's a man facing all kinds of trouble. His life is at risk. And this is what he says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from where comes my help. My help comes from the Lord which made, no, 131. 121 is also good, but 131 for today. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself with great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. He says, I turned around and went to sleep. Are you getting the picture? That's where God says, you have to lie down in my promises. You have to lie down. You have to rest in my promises. But what was their issue? Their issue was the promises of God. What did he give them? He gave them daily. Manna. And what did they not like? Manna. What does he give us? Daily? The word of God. What is that we don't like daily? The word of God. You know, how many people have come to this church says, you know, I cannot come because the word is too long. How many people have said, I, won't, I don't go for IPL because it's too long. The movie you want to watch in IMAX, how many people say the queue is too long? It was never too long, Right? So what does it mean? God makes us lie down. What does it mean? It means this. This is what it means. If there is any problem you are facing or I am facing, if I can handle it by virtue of my intelligence, my money, or my influence, I still have an experience, the presence of God. It is still not a miracle. Think about a situation that you face in your life. One of these three, you will try to handle it. One, you will try to handle it with your wisdom. Two, you will try to handle it with your money. And if you can't handle these two with your money, you don't have money to handle or wisdom to handle it. Third, you try to use influence. You call up somebody who can handle it for you. God says when these three fail, then you will experience me. So you know what he says, I will lead you in such a way where nobody can help you. I will. Until we experience God and God alone in our situation, it's not a miracle. Because a miracle is when you and I have come to the end of ourselves. And all we have is the word of God and nothing else but the word of God. And then God moves. I'm not saying that we need the word of God, for a lot of things which we do, which we don't need, because God has already given us the wisdom and the provision. But it's good to trust God and be grateful to God for all those things. That's important. To be grateful to God for all those things. That Lord, I know you have given me, and I just thank you for it. I'm not taking it for granted. I thank you, I praise you, that you look at it, give us this day our daily bread. Right? Now, is he really talking about daily bread? 
How many of you prayed for daily bread, but you ate your breakfast? You will eat your lunch too if you are not fasting, which is true. Is there anybody in this church who doesn't have resources for lunch today? Meet me after the service. Honestly, I will give you money to buy lunch. But the truth is that you all have provision. So he's not talking about daily bread in terms of provision. You have eaten, you have clothes, you have a roof over your head. It's more than that. It's more than that. So about that daily provision, God is saying, are you grateful? Have you seen the source? And you're really, really grateful to me that you really don't have a care today. Most of your worries are connected with tomorrow, not today. You will say, Lord, you don't know I am, I am 41, I am not still married. Why, if he gives your wife today, you will marry her today, what? He says, yes, there is a girl for you. You come to me, I am not going to get you married today. I will say, wait for another day. So why worry about it today? Today is the day of bachelorhood for you. And God has given you all the provision for that. So even your worry about not having a spouse is connected with tomorrow. So God says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has its own troubles. Today has been taken care of for you, which is true for everybody sitting here. Today has been taken care of. So all our worries are connected with tomorrow, not today. Not connected with, he's taken care of. So God says, you know what? I want you to experience me as a person. That's the purpose. So you will trust me more and more. Because only if you trust me can my purpose in your life be fulfilled. That is the purpose of every miracle. What is the purpose of every miracle? The purpose of the miracle is not people to make a testimony and a doctrine around the miracle was to make a testimony and a doctrine about the person behind the miracle. That's the purpose of the miracle. Miracle in the gospel according to John, all um, you don't have to turn, all of Jesus' miracles are called signs in an ivy. This was one of the first signs. The second sign. The third sign. What does it mean? It only means it was like a signboard pointing to Christ. The purpose of the miracle was that people would come to Christ. The pe- purpose of the miracle was not that people would make such a big racket about the miracle. It is about him. The purpose about every miracle they experience in the desert, we have experienced in the desert, in our life is that we trust God more and more and more and more. Why do I have to trust God? Because he's got a plan and a purpose for each one of us. That's why he chose us. He didn't choose us randomly for no purpose. He's got a purpose. Everybody sitting here, some of you are going to be pastors. You'll be sent out to the field. But you've been called with a purpose. He didn't say, you chose me. He said, I chose you. And what did I choose you? I chose you to bear much fruit. You are not chosen without a purpose. You are chosen with a purpose. But how can I bear fruit? How can his purpose come to pass unless I trust him? And the purpose behind every miracle is that I trust him and I trust him and I trust him. So that first thing he says is that, you know what? You enter into my rest. Enter. Enter into my rest. Are you getting the picture? The children of Israel were in Egypt for many, many years. But when God stepped in, all of Egypt was inflicted by the miracles of God. Inflicted by the miracles of God. Egypt just stood there and watched. Nothing happened to them. Why did God do all that? So that they would put their trust in Him. Put their trust in Him. And God is also telling you and me, do you put your trust in this? Little by little, has your trust increased? Has your trust really increased? Really, Do you really, really believe in my promises, in my word, in me more and more? Or tomorrow another situation comes, where do you run first? Wisdom, money, influence. Where do you go? Where do you go? Yesterday we had a situation, very bad situation. First instance is panic. Second instance is ask God. And ask God, God said, go back and do what you're called to do. You leave that to me. That's not your problem. That's my problem. You go as you are called to do. Study the word. I went back and continued studying the word. By the time in under five minutes around the world, they all came and said, Pastor, continue studying the word because tomorrow we want fresh manna. You do what you have to do. God will do the rest. That's all I did. I sent men back. And studied my word. 
And this is the situation was taken care of. No. But can I actually take care of the situation? No, I cannot. That is the truth. But God can. But even when we cannot take care of situations, what do we do? We panic. And we run around. And we try to help God. Which God doesn't want. That's why God created man on the sixth day after he finished everything. Otherwise, Adam would have said, no, 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 not that way, this way, this way. (laughs) So, God says, I have given you my word. What did God give Moses? He just gave him a staff. That's all he said. That's all you need. This represents my promises to you. My power, my provision, my promises. And he says, with this, you will bring my people out. You know what God has given his shepherds? He has even given his shepherds anything other than the word of God and the spirit of God. And he says, stand there before them week after week and tell them, with this, he will bring you out. And nothing else. With this, he will bring you out. The people may want a lot of other things. But God says, with this, you will bring them out. Moses, with this alone, you will bring them out. Are we getting the picture? So Moses goes first to Israel in Egypt and shows them the signs so they would believe. Did you know that? That's how he did He went to Egypt, he met the leaders of Israel in Egypt, showed them a few signs and they believed and they were all excited. Yes, now we are going to get out after all these years we are going to get out. Then he went to Pharaoh. Then he went to Pharaoh. It would have been very simple if Pharaoh had believed the first sign. Good for Egypt. Believe this first sign and let my people go. What was the first sign? What was the first sign, church? Just to wake you up. Hmm? He threw, Aaron threw his staff. What did it become? Become? Snake. And what did the magicians do? Put there. Remember, this has to get in the recording, so you have to be loud. What did the magicians do? They did the same thing. Their rods also became... And what was the miracle that happened? No, 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 no. Let me tell you, ask you this question. Aaron put a snake. They put a rod, it became a snake. The magicians put, let's say, ten snakes over there. And Aaron's snake was a big python and the others were small wipers. His python killed all the others. What is the miracle in that? There's no miracle there. That's not a sign. That's not a sign because if God does and change into a snake and the devil comes and changes his stick into a snake, then there is no miracle because if the devil can do what God can do, it is not a miracle. If I make a king cobra and the devil makes ten small cobras, my cobra eats all the cobras, what is the great miracle about it? It's not a miracle. The miracle is this. Read scripture carefully, Exodus seven twelve. That's the miracle. Seven and verse twelve. Quickly. Every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. It was not the serpent that was swollen. The word of God swallowed up every word of the devil. That was the miracle. There are a million ideologies floating around in the world. When anything is over, the word of God and the word of God alone will stand. It would have been all been destroyed by the word of God. That's the miracle, not the serpent. That's why Paul says, that's why we preach. That's why through the foolishness of preaching, God will deliver his people. The power is in the word, not in the snake. That is the miracle. That was the miracle. Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Because the rod represented the word of God. And the word of God swallowed up every ideology, every thought, everything that is floating around contrary to the word of God, to the, to the testimony of Christ will be swallowed up one day. And that's how you become the word of God. 
when the word of god swallows up all the ideologies of the devil and the world in you is swallowed up you become the word of god the staff of god in this world then you become a staff in moses hand in god's hand and god says i'm using you you know why because my word in you has swallowed up everything so scripture says bring every thought every imagination to the captivity of christ jesus you will know my power lie down lie down in green pastures lie down stand on my promises stand 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 there on my promises but the word of god i have a choice you have a choice my feelings my emotions my will my mis- wisdom the world my lust everything stands in the way and i have to choose i have to choose to believe the word of god and i have to choose to walk in the word of god and god says that rod will swallow it up it's a choice it's a choice we make if you are married and you are fighting it's a choice you can have peace by the time the service is over or you can choose to be angry it's a choice It's as simple as that. It's a choice. God says, I said before you life and death, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submit to your husband as unto Christ. It's a choice. It's as simple as that. He says, whoever chooses will have freedom. And if both of you choose, you will have power. It's a choice. And don't tell me it's impossible. It is possible. When you do that, you know what? The rod of Aaron swallows up the rods of the Pharaoh. It's eaten. It's as simple as that. But there is, like I said, when Eve went to pluck the fruit, God didn't catch her hand. He already told and he gave you the freedom to choose. He will never stop anybody from anything. He will not. Then he would be contradicting himself. Aaron is the high priest of the order of Levi. But Jesus is the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. question is will i allow jesus the high priest his word to swallow up everything else in me bring my feelings my emotions my thoughts my wisdom my power my influence everything under the word that's what it means humble thyself under the mighty hand of god and he will lift you up that means bringing everything to subjection stage by stage day by day So the first all Israel had to do was be still and let God deal with the Pharaoh. They didn't have to do anything. They just watched the fun fireworks at the Pharaoh's expense. Judgment upon judgment upon judgment, nothing touched Israel in Goshen. Nothing touched them. Israel was asked to do only one thing. I told you, what is that? Kill the Passover lamb. Apply the blood and eat it. You know what? That's all Jesus asks us of the first time. He says, believe, receive the work on the cross. That's all I ask you. That is the first green pasture we are led to. And that's what Jesus will always come and tell us what? Eat. Partake of my word. Partake of my spirit. Freely I give you both. There is no restriction to the word there is no restriction to the spirit in God's kingdom freely come and partake all you are thirsty come to me and drink all who are hungry come to me and eat there is no restriction there even practically he does the same thing in john chapter 21 verse 12 It's after every sign and wonder they're still going back. Peter is the one who goes fishing again. What does he say to them? Come, eat breakfast. We'll talk later. First come and eat. Come eat. What does he say? Verse 15. Same chapter, verse 15. 
quickly. Have you lost it? So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more? He's not going to ask you before the service. I promise you, he will not ask you before the service. After the service, he will ask you, now that you have eaten my word, do you love me a little more? He first feeds, then asks. Not like us. We will first ask. And if the answer is right, we will feed. Otherwise, you are not getting it. God says, no, I don't do stuff like that. He says, I first feed you. Once I have fed you, I will ask you. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Acts 1, verse 4 and 5. 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. What is it? For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What did he do? Don't do anything. Don't do anything. What do you do? Just be still in Jerusalem. Now we are outside Jerusalem. Once I have gone, go back to Jerusalem and wait. Drink. When the Holy Spirit comes, drink. Fill. First he said, eat. Forty days he fed them after resurrection too. What was he feeding them? The word. From the Moses to the prophets, he explained to them everything. Eat, he said. Now we have eaten. He said, don't do anything. Wait. Why? Now we have to drink. Drink. The Spirit of God will come. Drink. Once you have eaten and drunk, he will say, you can start doing some things. That's the format every day. Eat and drink. Come eat of my word. Eat of my, drink of my spirit. This is God's rest. He says he makes me lie down. But this is difficult. This is not easy for the flesh. Because the flesh wants to do. The flesh wants to do a lot of things. It's very difficult to get the flesh to lie down. Therefore you know what God does? God ordains circumstances in our lives where we are forced to lie down. Do you believe it? God ordained circumstances in David's life so that he would lie down. When he rested in the promises of God, God could lead David. When David was no longer resting on the promises of God, he started running. Why did he run? Because God could no longer lead him. Are you running today? Are you running? Are you being led? David ran. He wasn't being led. When he was led, it didn't matter who came against him, how many soldiers Saul had searching for him, they couldn't touch him. But when he stopped resting on the promises of God, the promise of God, the anointing of God, what happened? He ran. First time he ran, he acted like a madman. That's what happens. We think we are being very industrious. God says you are acting like a madman. What we may look in the world, what we may look in the spiritual realm are two different things. What does happen the first time David goes to the Philistine territory? Spittle all flowing, he's acting like a madman. And what did the king say? Get him out, he's a madman. Why? He was no longer resting, so God couldn't lead him. Second time again, he went into Philistine territory. This time he was smarter. He did not act like a madman. But he became what? A lying man. Put on a mask. How many months? Sixteen months. Was he led? No. He was not led at all. Why did he not follow God? Because he was no longer resting on the promises of God. He stepped outside the promises of God. He did not feed on them. He did not rest on them. And second time, it was a long, long stay away from God. And so many people have gone away from God. Yes, what you have is memory. In the Philistine territory, David also says, Ah, I remember those days when God spoke to me. That's why when you ask people about testimonies, they have nothing to say about yesterday. They have nothing to say about this morning. 
They will talk about 1947, I remember. 1988, I remember. What about yesterday? Wasn't your God living? Did he have anything to say yesterday? What about this morning? Did he say anything this morning? I thought we saw a living God. When did his voice cease? If two people are walking together and they're talking to each other and the conversation has stopped, who stopped? Who moved? God says, I didn't. I didn't move. Because my promises are yes and amen. I said, I would never leave you, nor forsake you. He said, James, you moved. Are we getting? Our, we also like David, go into the world, away from the promises of God, purpose of God, and we build our city. He named it Ziklag, we name it something else. And we call it Resume. He called it Ziklag. And if somebody comes and asks, even if it's a stranger, the Spirit of God asks and comes and says, yes, you are not praying like before, you are not walking like God, with God like before. He will show his resume. Look at my works. This is what I do. What did David point at? Ziglag? What do you mean God is not with me? I have more now today than I had in the old days. When I was being led by the Spirit, I was running every day. Now, look at the city I have built. Look at my positions. Then one day when he came back, he found there was nothing there. The city had been burned down. One day you will realize your resume will not get you a job. And you will say, Lord, what happened? He said, I shut it down. But Lord, he says, and you will be wondering, look at my resume. This is better than most, I know. Yet, with this resume, I cannot even open the lightest door. God says, I shut it. Didn't I tell you the door that I shut, no man can open. Why? Because you have a call and a purpose to be led by me. Only then the purpose can be fulfilled. I will shut that door. I will make you lie down. One day the city was suddenly burned down. Right? Ziglag was burned down. Even when Ziglag is burned down, what do you we say? We'll say, it's okay. I have 600 men with me. I will start again. Then you look around. What does scripture say? They are all picking stones. He says, oh, you're putting trust in your company, right? Let me tell you, David, your company has no more trust in you. But how can that happen? He said, I did it. Lie down. Are you getting the picture? One day the prodigal son realized, oh, there's no money. He would have thought, okay, my friends are there, no? they will invite me for lunch. Nobody did, friends left. And you're looking around, where are my friends? God said, I sent them away. But why, Lord? So that you will go to the pig pen. Why? Because your destination is to the father's house. I know how to get you there. And when I shut a door, don't think anybody will open it. Nobody is going to open it. No man has opened a door which God has shut. He made David lie down. Now let me tell you, everybody doesn't react like David. Or most men will react like David's men. You know how David's men reacted? Scripture says, everybody was bitter in the spirit because of their children and were talking about stoning David. Are there parents who are bitter in the spirit because your children have walked away from God and is thinking about stoning the son of David? Are there women sitting here who is bitter in the spirit because your spouse has walked away and wants to stone actually the son of David? One of the ways we react Let me tell you honestly, very few people react like David. Most people react like David's servants. They were bitter in the spirit. Why? Because of their loss. And what are they thinking about? They are thinking about stoning this man who will bring salvation into their lives. 
Why is that when things go wrong, people don't say the devil did it. Why did they say, God, why did you do this to me? Why do we, our instant response is, God is the author of calamity and tragedy. And not the author of deliverance. You know why? Because we don't trust him. We don't trust him. Are we getting the picture? Exodus 14.11 Response. Check our response and see if our response tallies with this. They said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Why? No water. What's all? What is it? No What did you see in Egypt? What did you experience when you came out of Egypt? Now, you didn't have water. Immediately, what happened to your faith? What happened to your trust? Exodus 15, 23 and 24. 23 and 24. Quickly, okay? Twenty-three. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Now you have to read scripture carefully. What did the people each time say? They complained against Moses. Later they will complain against Moses and Aaron. What does it mean? Sheep who doesn't know their actual shepherd is Jesus, will complain about the shepherd. You know why they complained always against Moses? Because none of them had any relationship with Yahweh. Moses had. They didn't. Chapter 16, verse 2 and 3. First time they complained there was no water. Second time they complained the water was bitter. What does it mean? First time we complain, Lord, I have no wife. Second time we complain, our wife is bitter. (laughs) He said, you did not have a wife. You badgered me day and night and gave you one. Now you are complaining, that was not the one I wanted. The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. What were their problem? The children of Israel said, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now what is our third complaint? She doesn't know how to cook. I'm making it relevant to our times, our complaints. We don't realize, in theory, we complain just like Israel. Without realizing... We asked God for many of these things. But we never asked for God to come along with it. So we were never content. We were never content. That's how David's men was. Bitter in the spirit. Anybody could be here. Because of a son, a daughter, a colleague, a spouse. And God says, are you bitter? Are you complaining? Are you grumbling? Are you complacent? Why? Because he says, nobody in this community sought me except Moses. Nobody in the company of David sought God except David. Can he lead us? How can he lead us? Unless I lie down. What does scripture say? We sing it. The righteous run into the name of the Lord. The righteous run into the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord, by the way? Revelation 19, 13. What does it say? And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Ask ourselves this question. As we are growing in the Lord, when we run into situations, do we run into this and hide in this? 16 months David ran 
he wasn't led and he built one day it was lost when it was lost he looked around his servants were there against him what did he do 16 months later you hear a cry from his mouth what is that abiyatar abiyatar who is abiyatar the priest abiyatar bring the effort seek the lord's face god said understood david that's why i made all these things so you would lie down now you sought me right 16 months you did not seek me now you sought me now that you have sought me i will answer you abiyatar what does the lord say the lord says pursue but overtake it's not enough to pursue it's not enough to pursue some of you it is not enough to pursue why because you have been in the enemy territory for a long time you now need to run faster and overtake because the enemy has stolen your blessings you need to run faster than him and overtake him and take what he has stolen because you were complacent he stole it's not enough to pursue you have to overtake because many people are pursuing but if you and the enemy is running at the same pace and he's 10 miles away you will run all your life and never get anything back you have to run faster than him we have to run why because we were complacent after hearing and knowing and experiencing god we went into the world and we are complacent and we have our accomplishments like ziglag to show and now god is making you lie down and you want to hear the word of god and god says run overtake recover so question is will we let god lead us david did god let david lead him do we understand his ways do we trust him are we getting the picture that's the question that's why i said the first time we looked at psalm 23 you cannot have psalm 23 unless you have psalm 22 Psalm 22 is the story of the crucifixion. God never asks us to trust him. This is my question. Look at God's order. Did God ask Israel to do anything before they had sacrificed the Passover lamb? No. He never asked them to do anything. After they had sacrificed the Passover lamb and put the blood on the lentils of the house, the angel of death had passed over. He said, now obey me. Why? If you do not see the love of God on Calvary and after that you still won't follow him, he says, what else can I do? What else can I do? You have to first know this. I love you beyond you can think. And you look at the cross, I will prove to you that I love you. I love you. Look at Romans 5 verses 8 and 8, 9 and 10. This is where God starts. But God demonstrates what does he do? Not talks, not speaks, not with PowerPoint. No, he says I demonstrate. I demonstrate his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and verse no go much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god through the death of his son much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life getting the picture god says when i died for you when you were a sinner and now that you know me how much more will i do that now you are my son do you love me that's why he's asking peter the question is not that is not the way we do in the world in the world we will look and bring peter here and says peter this are the sheep i am going to give it to you do you see all this one this is raj this is abel this is nadesh this is peter richi vilas yash do you love them <laughs> Yes, Lord, I love them. Okay, feed them. He didn't ask them. He says, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, you will feed them. Do you love me? Then you will feed them. You know what Paul said? 
He is going through everything possible a man can go through. Does he stop? He doesn't stop. You know why? Because he says the love of Christ constrains me. I cannot stop because I love him. And this is what he told me to do. If you love your sheep, when the sheep becomes ram, you will leave. But if you love Christ, it doesn't matter what the sheep become, you will never leave. You will stay. You will stay till your last moment. You will stay because the love of Christ constrains you. That's what he's saying. Do you love me? I have demonstrated my love for you. Because out of that love will come trust. That is why we trust. It is not like children do. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. You know how? You know, girls used to do, right? Remember college days? He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Oh, he loves me not. That's not. You want to try it with God, I will tell you. He loves me. 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 Pluck it all. He says, I still love you. You can do everything. Strip me. Beat me. Pluck my beard. Spit on me. Break my head. Crucify me. I still love you. You cannot stop me loving you. Because I am love. And I have loved you with an everlasting love. He says, after that, do you trust me? He says, love and trust go together. If you cannot trust this kind of love, then what can I do? I don't have to understand his ways. I don't have to understand all his ways. I have to love him. And to love him, all I have to look is at his cross. All I have to look is at his cross. When I look at the cross and we ask Holy Spirit to open our hearts and spirits to the power of the cross and the power of his love, we fall in love with him. After we fall in love with him, we start walking with him and he will show us his ways little by little. He will lead us. He will lead us. Isn't that in John 10, 11 to 13 he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. So when I do pastor's training, when I talk to pastors individually, I ask them first thing, ask yourself, are you a hireling or are you a shepherd? If you really want to be a shepherd, it will cost you your life. It will cost you a life. You will have to give up a lot of things in life. And don't expect the sheep to be always complimentary either. You may get nothing back from any sheep. But that isn't irrelevant. Because you are called to be the shepherd who will lay down his life. Otherwise you are just a hireling. What does the hireling do? Hireling hires himself to the one who gives him better wages. That's all. The wolves can come in different forms. The wolf doesn't come always with fangs. How does he come? With a big paycheck for a bigger opening in the ministry. Or you can leave ministry and you have a new job in the MNC. Wolves come in different ways. But God says, are you a hireling? Or are you a shepherd? He says, I'm a shepherd. I'm a good shepherd. And I lay down my life for my sheep. Right? When we come out of Egypt... The world, we don't like what is served in the house of God. You know why we don't like what is served in the house of God? Because we haven't tasted God. Moses had tasted God. So he liked what was given in the desert. The others did not. They followed Moses. That's the problem with a lot of believers. They are believers. They are not believers in Jesus. They are believers in Moses. They only know, there are some of, many of them know DGS, many know Benny Hinn, many know Joyce Meyer, many know TD Jakes. They still don't know Christ. Give them the Bible and a book from Joyce Meyer. I will read Joyce Meyer. Right? She speaks to you or what? Oh, Christ speaks to you. I'm not saying you shouldn't read her. I'm saying, who speaks to you? Christ or a man or a woman? 
who speaks to you or even when they speak does christ speak through them or do you listen to their opinion and their fancies that's our problem that was israel's problem only one man had experienced god the other experienced the acts of god exodus 16 and verse 3 we may have to it's slow and the children had said to them oh that we had died by the hand of the lord in the land of egypt when we sat by the pots of meat when we ate bread to the full for you have brought us out into the wilderness to eat this whole assembly kill this whole assembly with hunger you know what this is when you have eaten the food of egypt you don't understand the ways of god we don't understand the ways of god i'll show to you exodus 13 quickly verses 17 and 18 let me read it for you 13 sometimes we don't understand what god is doing exodus 13 17 and 18 then it come to pass when the pharaoh had let the people go that god did not lead them by the way of the land of the philistines as though that was near for the lord said lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to egypt so the lord led the people around by the way of wilderness of the red sea and the children of israel went up in an orderly ranks out of the land of egypt Did you get it this is egypt this is promised land this was the easy way to go how do you go go like this what did god do he said no i'll take them this way and that's our problem too lord i am saved i thought you be i would be in ministry god says no take the long route you are not ready for anything lord i thought i am saved today i will prosper tomorrow he says no you are not ready for anything take the long route we don't understand god's ways he takes the long route that's the problem the lord is my shepherd yes i shall not want which is true he took us the long route but he took care of us verse 20 21 and 22 of the same chapter exodus then we will understand what he did in the long route so they took their journey from sukoth camdi and atam at the edge of the wilderness and the lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night he did not take away the pillar of cloud by the day or the pillar of fire by the night from before the people what does it mean he took care of them day and night now let me ask you this question did he take care of you day and night though it was a very long route has he taken care of you no we don't think about that we only think why haven't i reached there why haven't reached there why haven't reached there Have you no old joke you take children on a vacation first 15 minutes they're excited after that they start sounding like the trains wheels when will we reach when will we reach when will we reach when we will reach when we will reach when we will reach monotonous it goes on that's how israel is asking when will we reach when we will reach when we will reach promised land milk and honey promised land milk and honey god says hang on you are not ready you are not ready you don't know me i know you verse 14 verse 1 and 2 now comes the problem now the lord spoke to moses saying speak to the children of israel that they turn and camp before pai aharyot between migdol and the sea opposite baal zephon you shall camp before it by the sea now because we don't understand all this is the problem the problem is he took them through this long route and brought them here and said stop say lord why am i here because when i look in the front i only see the sea and one side are mountains 
other side is a blocked and behind the pharaoh is coming with his army why did you bring me here god says to lie down if you had one way of escape you would have run so i have brought you where you are forced to lie down lie down do you understand how he has hedged many of you he has hedged many of you he says i brought you to the law because i know you well you will never lie down one chance you will scoot so i brought you through the long route and i have brought you here and have set you out here now try to run why 600 chariots and the army of egypt is behind you what will you do what will you do ahead is the red sea what does the pharaoh think 14 verse 3 Exodus 14 and verse 3 For the Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel they are bewildered by the land and the wilderness has closed them in What will the Pharaoh say The Pharaoh will say oh these people poor people they are so confused they are blocked on every side let us go after him God says you don't worry the devil doesn't understand me The devil will say oh that poor fellow child of god is hedged he will think i got him in my hand you don't realize israel you are bait in my hand i will fix him let him come after you this was the purpose i will fix him you just stay still the purpose to bring you over here was for your deliverance and his destruction and you didn't see that otherwise you know what israel you will go another way i can take you this way you will reach into the wilderness you will go into canaan but egypt will always come after you once i'm finished with egypt egypt in their history has never come after israel once and for all egypt was finished even down to our century during the war egypt airplanes did not even take off the airfields before that they were destroyed god has never allowed egypt to come against israel from that day he says that was the purpose your enemies of your past the ones who have been pursuing you who have been after your destiny i have brought you this long way so that he will be destroyed completely that he will never come after you again you will face new enemies but you don't have to face the enemies of your past that is my purpose do you understand me that's why god says i have to make you lie down then only i can lead you but you won't lie down you won't lie down he says i have to i have to i have to what are the people's response verse 10 people are new believers so don't get upset those of you who become pastors in future don't get upset when lambs respond like this and the pharaoh drew near the children of israel lifted their eyes and behold the egyptians marched after them so they were very afraid and the children of israel cried out to the lord isn't that how you do every time you call me or you call my wife my wife says honey what do what should i say i say chill That's all I say chill tell them to chill why was god says be still 21st century of be still is chill <laughs> if i tell you be still you don't understand when i tell you chill you understand hmm? why because this battle is god's not ours before i can show what to do next i have to be still we are saying lord lead me lead me lead me show me god says still be still fast be still they cried they howled they were so scared and they said all kind of stuff why did you bring us here why did you do it you do this thing just like newly wed wives will complain to husbands no i've heard about some of the newly wed saying that in two weeks you have already changed <laughs> god says this is a newly wed girl it's okay let her say whatever she want she is newly married no she just getting to know me but verse 15 And the Lord said to Moses, "Why do you cry to me? Man of God, you experience me in the fire. You know me face to face. You are a shepherd. You have known me. That's why I allowed you to climb those steps and stand before the sheep. Why are you crying?" The people can cry. You cannot echo their cry. You cannot echo their cry because if you cry, then they are lost. You are not allowed to cry. you have to speak what i tell you to speak you are not allowed to cry why are you crying have you forgotten they have no word they have no staff that's the word they don't know this they have an experience the power of the living god they can cry 
You cannot cry. Why? Because you have your rod with you. Come. Your situation and their situation may be the same. Both of you have to cross the same sea. But you don't cry. You go there week after week and stretch my word before them and I will open the sea for them. You have to be here. Otherwise, what will you do? You will cross alone and go. But that's why I have called you a shepherd who will lay down his life for his sheep so that you be on this side and cross only along with them. You know how to cross. You have experienced my power, but they haven't. So I brought you to this side. I allowed you to be broken first so that you can lead the broken people across. That is how shepherds are made. You don't cry, he says. Why are you crying, Moses? You cannot cry because you have the staff with you. You got the staff. It's not your power. It's not your might. It's not your intelligence. It's not even your experience. It's the power of that anointed word that will take my people through. Stretch forth your rod. Stretch your hand over the sea and divide it. Divide it for them. When they come to you, don't give your counsel. Don't give your answer. Divide the sea for them with the word of God and let them walk. You cannot make them walk. You can only divide the sea. You cannot make anybody walk. But with the word, you can open up and show this is the way. This is the way to take. And what did he do? And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Come to the next. And come further down. Further down. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into the dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall on them on their right and on their left. Are you getting the picture? He leads me beside still waters. The waters were still on both sides and they walked through it. They walked through it. All night they walked and the morning came. They were on the other side. The night is not yet over. The morning is very close. He's still taking people across. The morning, the third day morning is very near. And when that day comes, he will shut and the Pharaoh and his army will be destroyed forever. The devil and his followers will be destroyed forever. But he says, pass. Go through. Still waters. That's the power of his promise. That's the power of his word. That's the word we lift up. We have to lift up the word. We have to lift up the word above your feeling, above your emotions, above your sympathy, above the need of your family, your congregation, whatever. Lift the word up. Don't cry, Moses. No one cry. You cannot cry. This is not the time to cry. This is the time to lift up the word. Lift it up. And I will separate the waters for the people. Because you have to move on. Be still, God tells Israel. Be still. Fear not. Be still. And see the deliverance of God. Be still. If you am right, it's in verse 13, uh, 12 and 13. Be, do not be afraid. Fear not. Stand still and see the deliverance of Israel. Of, see your deliverance. And what does God say in verse 16? The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. Verse 16. But lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the divide, and the children of Israel shall go on. Shall go on. In our mind, it's all contradictory. Don't fear. Be still. Hold your peace. And keep walking. God says it's all one act of faith. It's all one act of faith. Continue doing what you have to do. Don't worry about your situation. God will open it up for you. That's an act of faith. Paul and Silas, what do you have to do when you're thrown in prison? What do we always do at the midnight hour? Not sleep. Paul is used to worshipping at the midnight hour. So he worshipped as he always did at the midnight hour. Early in the morning I have sought you. Late in the night also I have sought you. As in the psalmist said, 
So in the midnight hour, what is Paul used to? Paul is used to worshipping God. So what if my legs are tied and hands are tied? I can still worship God. And what does scripture say? God came in and separated the waters. Another man, Peter, worships early in the morning, sleeps well at night. So you are going to face execution tomorrow. What will you do, Peter? Sleep well. Right? Why should I fear? Because he has put me in green pastures. I will rest. Peter is so fast asleep. The angel has to come and smack him. Wake up. And the waters were separated for him. Just go walk. The chains fell off. He were chained to two sentries when the chains... Have you seen chains? It makes a clinging, clinging sound. The sentries did not wake up. They heard nothing. The sentries at the doorpost saw nothing. The doors were all opening by itself. Why? Because he makes the waters part for us and dry land appears. He leads us beside still waters. And when he came to the road, he left him there and said, Now you know where to go. Where do you go? Oh, let me go to my wife. No, go to the house where they are praying. Go there. That's where you need to go. He didn't go home. He went to where they were praying. The girl who came, he was knocking at the door. She came without opening. She ran and said, oh, Peter is there. Nobody knew how Peter is there. Stuff we also do. We forget to open the door. In our excitement. God will release you and leave you on the road and says, I did my part. Now choose where you will go. He still leaves you to choose. I have released you. You came to the church because you had an issue. You were prayed for. Now, will you come back next week? Will you be found again? Or, oh, thank you Lord for my deliverance. Thank you Lord. That shall be my testimony for the rest of my life. That's a testimony. It's a testimony of God. But that's the only testimony you have. Jesus also came and asked a man, do you want to get well? He's not waiting for still waters. He's waiting for troubled waters. What does he say? Oh, once a year, oh, once in a while, an angel comes and troubles the waters. The first one who gets in gets healed. I've been waiting for 38 years. Jesus says, do you want to get well? Pick up your mat and walk. And Jesus went away. Didn't follow him. Where are you going? Where are you going? Let me see where are you going? He just left. Where did he go? He went straight to the house of God. And when he went to the house of God, whom did he find there? Jesus was there. And you know what? Jesus had another word to tell him. You know what? You know why? Many people haven't heard from God after their first testimony. Because after that, they were not found in the house of God. He was waiting for you there, but you were not found. So he couldn't lead you further. He couldn't lead you further. He had a word for him. A very specific word for him. Individual for him. There were a whole group of worshippers there. To one man alone, Jesus says, I have a word for you. For you. And that's what happens. Even in this message, some people are receiving a word from God. And you know God is speaking to you. He's speaking to you. This is the shepherd who leads us. Who makes us lie down. He makes us lie down. He brings us to these situations in our life where he says, rest in me. Rest in me. And then he says, make this your life. Rest, 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 rest. I will lead you. And I will restore your soul. Every day there is a restoration that is happening. You know why? Because when I came to Christ, my soul had been messed up by the, the Egypt. I had a body, I had a soul, and I had a spirit. You know what Solomon says? Oh, when a man dies, what happens? His body goes to the dust, the spirit goes back to the God who gave it. Where does your soul go? Either to heaven or hell. Your spirit is not you, that's what God breathed into you. That goes back to him. And if your soul and your spirit are not together, you will go to the wrong place. So it's my soul that is the problem. So what the scripture says, he restores my soul. 
He restores my soul. He restores. And as He restores my soul, you know what? Being led becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. Do you have less problems? No. You have more. Are you more worried? No, you are less worried. Because, no, now you are experiencing He is my shepherd. And I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not want. This is what happened to Israel. They only experienced God's power. They did not experience God's person. They did not experience God's person. Have you got it, church? It's not enough to experience God's power. A thousand times in your life, you still can experience His power a thousand times in your life and still not experience His person. These are two different things. How many days are there in a year? Good in mathematics, 365 into 40. How many thousands? Think. 14, okay, rough figure, 15,000. Right? 15,000 days Israel experienced God's power without experiencing His presence. Don't go through life like that. I would rather experience God's presence one day in my life than experience His power 15,000 times. One day. That's what David says. One day in your courts. One day, O oh Lord, one day. One day. Experiencing His power doesn't necessarily change your heart, your mind. You have to experience Him. That Moses did at the fire. He experienced God. They didn't. Joshua did. Caleb did. And God says, do. How many miracles do you need? The problem with this, you can experience 15,000 miracles and then when it comes to the 15,001 situation, you still will not believe. Oh, can God do this? Why? Because this is a new situation. You have experienced God the first time and then every new situation you will say, God can do it. Why? Because he, I know him, he's God. Nothing is impossible with him. How many miracles did Abraham and Sarah experience? At 90, when God comes and says, Sarah, you will have a baby this year. Abraham, your wife will have a baby this year. What did she do? She laughed. And God said, why did you laugh? Why did you laugh? What does he say? Is anything impossible? Too hard for God. Is that our reaction? The next problem we face after experiencing miracle in 2013, 2014 is coming. Next one, a different situation altogether and we are already planning how to come through this. Call, see how much money we have, how many people I need to call up. Oh, God says, why are you laughing? Is it too difficult for me? Just because your problem has changed. Have I changed? I am God. That's what he means. I'm the same yesterday, today and forever. I don't change. I'm the same God. Doesn't matter what your problem is. I can handle it. But to handle it, will you please lie down? I want to lead my people through my promises. Why? Because I said my promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Lie down in Christ. Be rested in Christ. And I will lead you. And I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. That's what I have to say to you. And to the church around the world, every GTC, every nation. God is saying, doesn't matter what, who is pursuing him, how strong his army is, how many chariots he has, GTC, move on. Move on. The enemies that you see, you will not see them. They are destined for destruction. You are destined for glory. Know the difference. Your destiny is glory. Even death has no power over you. Death has no power over us. 
I honestly pray many of us will cry out to God and say, deliver me from the fear of pain. Nobody is afraid of death. Everybody is afraid of pain. I mean, I am not afraid of death. It's a pain. Say, Lord, deliver me from the fear of pain. Then you will realize you actually have nothing to fear. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Even that has been swallowed in victory. Because of who has led us and is leading us. Shall we pray? Oh Father, this morning, our cry to you is, help us to lie down. Help us to rest so that you can lead us. And I pray for every child in this room, every mother, every father, every wife, every husband, every young man. You know what troubles them. As your word says in Hebrews 4.12, absolutely nothing is hidden from you. The whole of creation is open before your eyes. Nothing is hidden. We can act in front of one another. Before you, nobody acts. And I pray, Father, today, I pray, Lord, you will meet your children at their point of need. Fathers who are worrying. Mothers who worry. Wives who are agitated. Husbands who are agitated. Single parents who are crying out. Orphans who feel rejected. They are all there in this small group. Everyone is represented here, Lord. Father, I pray they will hear your voice telling them this morning. A bruised reed, I will not break. A smoking flax, I will not put out. I am meek, I am lowly, and I am gentle. And I love you. And I love you. I pray, Lord, they will hear your voice in their hearts telling them that you have loved them. You love them. Even the hairs on the head are counted. Their name is engraved in the palms of your hand. Nobody can pluck us from your hand or the Father's hand. You are with us always. You don't even need a number. He said if two of you, two, two, and if there is only one, you still come and fulfill that quorum and become two. For you love us. You love us. You love us. Out of that love, Father, I pray, trust will arise. And we will rest. We will rest in your promises. We will rest in your love. We will rest knowing that you care for us. Then we will hear your voice. Then you will lead us. And we will know where you lead. It's been always been green pastures. It always restores my soul. Then when the hour of judgment comes, we will know. Thank you Lord. I am not lean in my soul. I am fat in my soul. I am not wasting away in the midst of troubles and the judgment that is coming on the world. I am standing there strong because there is no leanness in my soul because you restores my soul. I am not eaten away by anger and bitterness and envy and jealousy and slander and gossip and resentment and revenge. No Lord, I am eaten up by love for you. Love for your children. A heart, oh Father, we would be able to say is consumed by your love. And I pray, Father, that would be the cry of every heart here today. Touch. That there be a supernatural touch today, Lord. Touch. Touch on your people. Touch them. Young ones, touch them. Children, touch them. Parents, touch them. Grandparents, touch them. For your word says, you are the sheep of my pasture, the sheep of my hand. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The world may have many titles, but thank you, we are just sheep. Just sheep. Just sheep. And we have a shepherd. We just want to praise you just want to worship you, just want to adore you. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. 
Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. Amen and amen.